everyone, and welcome to this week's Wildlife Weekly Wednesday Roundup. I'm your host, Tenley Thompson, and we've got some exciting things to show you this week from the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. So the way this is gonna work is our guides have been taking fantastic video all this week of all the great things that have been going on in Grand Teton, Yellowstone, and the surrounding areas. We're gonna show you that, then we have a trivia question of the week, which is a chance to win a gift card to our EcoTour store. Lastly, I'll be answering your questions live at the end of the broadcast. So if you have a, a question for me that's Grand Teton, Yellowstone, naturalist, wildlife biology related, go ahead and type it in the comments and let me know and I'll be able to answer it at the end of the broadcast. Now our big news this week are wolves and grizzly bears. And I figure we might as well get started with everybody's favorite, Grizzly Bear 399, who's been having a mixed week in terms of good and bad. Let's check in. Hey everybody, uh, we had another chance to check out 399 and her four cubs. And that doesn't come as any surprise. We've seen a few other bears hanging out in that area. Uh, it's a popular, popular place for bears because it's a popular place for elk and their calves. A lot of elk will find their way up from the elk refuge over the winter, eventually making their way up into Northern Grand Teton Park uh, to, to calve in these willows where they can hide their babies away. They'll hide them away there because they're too weak to join the rest of the group. They'd be easily susceptible to predation, um, but at least in the willows, they have a chance to hide as mom can return and nurse them as they physically mature. What these grizzlies are doing out here is looking for these calves, maybe pressing on bushes seeing uh, what they can find. Now for those of you new to our broadcasts, Grizzly Bear 399 is 24, 24 years old and has had almost 20 cubs over the years. She showed up this spring with quadruplets, which is just so exciting to watch, and we've really been having a great time seeing her. Now, please tell us where you're watching from. I'd love to see how far away this broadcast is going. And if you like the video, we encourage you to share it with your friends. The more people we get to watch it every week, the more we can expand and grow it. Let's check in with 399's 12 year old daughter, Grizzly Bear 610, who we also had good views of this week, along with her two two year old cubs. Another highlight we got to see this week uh, came from Grizzly Bear 610. She and her two cubs were actively digging uh, in a morning that had very low visibility. There was a lot of fog hanging low and all of a sudden 610 and her two cubs came out of these willows and started digging down uh, for some of the root systems of some of the growing plants in that area. And it was really neat to see her kind of showing her cubs uh, the dynamics of trying to excavate uh, the ground to get at some of the food sources. It was kind of a neat teaching moment that you could see mom passing on to her two young cubs. And you know, those young cubs are looking pretty good right now and 610 is a pretty well-fed bear. So a lot of good, really exciting activity happening in the GYE this week. Thanks for watching. We'll see, uh, we'll have some more updates for you next week. So some great views of 610. Some really interesting things happened to those two grizzlies and their cubs this week. For starters, they actually came in contact with each other. For those of you all who are not necessarily familiar with the history of Grand Teton's grizzly bears and are not quite as much of a nerd about them as I am, Grizzly Bear 399, sort of the matriarch of the grizzly bears in the Tetons, gave birth to 610 12 years ago. Many, many years ago, when 399 and 610 both had cubs, they actually ended up exchanging a cub. 399 had triplets and 610 had twins. And I went out and I saw both of them. And then the next day I had a trip with guests and I went out and I saw what I thought was 399, but I only saw twins. And I said, well, I must be wrong, even though the size difference between the two of them made them very obvious who was who in those days. And then I saw 610 wandering around with triplets and I realized what had happened. 610 had somehow adopted one of 399's cubs. Traditionally, the way that that works is that 
if two female grizzlies get into an interaction with each other, they'll send the cubs up into the trees for their own protection. Then once they've kind of figured out their dominance battle, they'll call the cubs down and sometimes the wrong cub ends up going with the wrong mother. We're not sure exactly what happened in this particular case, but the good news is, is 610 successfully raised 399's cub to adulthood, which if you're counting is her own sister. So we haven't had a lot of interaction between the two since then. And it was really surprising this week when the two of them actually met in the same meadow. Now, if you're following, Grizzly Bear 399 currently has quadruplets and 610 currently has twins. And it was really exciting to see the whole family get together. Our good friends, Jack and Gina Bales, who were really nice enough to let us use some of their footage this week, caught an amazing view of the family reunion. Definitely check out Jack and Gina's work. It's really phenomenal photography and they've got a great YouTube channel as well. So thanks guys, let's check this out. There's 399 and 610 all together. So pretty extraordinary stuff. Now that's a pretty complicated family tree. And it's really important that we not anthropomorphize our grizzly bears. We not treat them like people or give them human characteristics and traits because they're cool enough as grizzlies as they are, right? And so I don't wanna overdo it, but I did sort of have to think this through. Grizzly bear 399's four cubs are siblings of grizzly bear 610, who's 12, right? And her cubs, 610's cubs, are the nieces and nephews, I think, of 399's new quadruplets, which is really strange because they're older than their uncles and aunts. How confusing of a family tree is that for you? But the good news is all of them are doing well. And I say that because we had one more concerning situation with 399 this week. On Sunday, one of the cubs got separated from its mother. Basically what happened is 399 had killed an elk calf, was on the carcass, just like Kirk's been talking about earlier. And for some reason, uh, one of the cubs got across the road, got separated, and we couldn't necessarily figure out why that had happened. For about 12 hours, that little itty bitty cub was all by itself about a mile away from mom and the other three cubs. We became very, very concerned. It started to get dark. And then just as a rainstorm was in full tilt, we saw all four of them together again. So a rough 12 hours for that little cub. They're definitely really vulnerable this time of year and they're vulnerable when they're this young. But the good news is all four of them are back together and all is well. I think we should all be prepared to understand that the odds of all four quadruplets surviving in the long run are pretty low, but I'm glad that we still got four and we didn't lose one on Sunday. Okay, so enough about grizzly bears for just a little bit. Let's talk about some other amazing footage we got this week. Ecotour Adventures Guide Verlin actually caught a pronghorn antelope giving birth. Let's check it out. So Ecotour Guide Verlin got this unbelievable footage of a pronghorn giving birth now pronghorn always give birth to twins, so you can see she's in labor and has already delivered her first little fawn there. And she's licking that fawn down, cleaning it up, making sure it's scentless so no predators can find it. And that little guy's trying to take his first steps. Uh, definitely having a hard time getting up off of the ground, but this little guy definitely eventually did. You can see he's looking to try and suckle off of his mother, but can't quite figure out where the milk might be coming from. It's definitely not gonna come from his, from her neck, little guy. Um, but these two, Verlin said, did very, very well and eventually were able to move off with their mother. So really incredible footage from Verlin there. Eco Tour Adventures guide 
Josh also got some footage of a newborn pronghorn this week. And then here's the two fawns trying out some fresh green grass. Obviously, they're definitely dependent on mom's milk right now, but sampling different forage, particularly mimicking mom's behavior, is critically important to learn in the long term how to feed yourself. You can see these guys are still pretty wobbly. Josh reports that both of the fawns seem to be doing really well and were able to walk off with mom, as we'll see at the end of this video here. So thanks very much to Eco Tour Adventures guide Josh for that really phenomenal footage that he took this week of that little pronghorn fawn. So th for those of you who've been out on a trip with me, you know that I'm obsessed with pronghorn. I just love them. And it can sometimes be hard to explain all of the many, many, many ways that they're amazing animals. Their incredible speed, they're the second fastest land animals on the planet. Their ability to give birth to twins, the fact that they can um, run so fast but can't jump a fence because their speed has made them built for that and not very much else. The fact that they're so old as a species that they were around during the time of woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers. They're an ice age animal that never went extinct. All of these things make me so excited about them. But at the end of the day, baby pronghorn kind of say it all. You can't do better than those adorable baby pronghorn. So thanks very much to Verlin and Josh for that incredible once in a lifetime footage of seeing that pronghorn give birth. That really is something else entirely. Let's switch gears now to some also incredible footage of wolves. We'll check in with two of our guides who are up in Yellowstone this week, Mark and Josh. A highlight uh, from my week came up in Yellowstone. Uh, earlier this week, we were in the Hayden Valley and we were able to see some incredible wolf activity. Uh, we had 12 adult members of the Wapiti Pack, uh, 10 of which were up on top of this rise and they were congregated, um, kind of celebrating what seemed like a feeding event and they all started howling. And as they were howling, I started scanning behind us, kind of in the direction that the wolves were looking, and there was two other adult members on the opposite side of the Yellowstone River. Uh, as the howling continued, both of those members of the pack swam the Yellowstone River, crossed the road in the Hayden Valley, and then reunited with the other 10 adults. So we were able to see 12 adult members of the Wapiti Pack with some pretty amazing uh, behavior going on with them communication wise and um, and you know just the social dynamic of those wolf packs it was pretty fascinating to watch Hello everyone, Josh Menton from Jackson Lake Eco Tour Adventures here. I want to tell you about a wolf video we got recently. In the video, 1048M, who's a male collared wolf from the Junction Butte pack, is scavenging a bison carcass. Wolves largely kill their own food, but they also will scavenge. Uh, and sometimes they might leave a carcass for a week and go patrol, but they always inevitably end up coming back. It's a pretty big risk factor for a wolf to hunt and so they definitely don't want to be wasting food by leaving it behind. Uh, in addition, we also have ravens and magpies and bald eagles and even red-tailed hawks and black bears and grizzly bears and all these other scavengers that will go after carcasses of animals that have been either died or been killed by predators in Yellowstone. It's uh, part of the reason that there is no waste in nature and something that we consistently see over and over while watching wildlife in Yellowstone. To see wolves in Yellowstone is such a remarkable experience. And if it's something that you'd like to see for yourself, a guide is a necessity. It took me 
decades to learn how to find wolves well. And then when I started to run trips specifically to find wolves, like our fall photography adventure and our multi-day trips, I can't tell you how gratifying it was to find these amazing, unbelievable creatures in the wild. So I do hope you'll consider that. More on our fall photography workshop later, but in the meantime, some great wolf footage and some great views of the wolves of the Lamar Valley. Let's get back to grizzly bears, because honestly, you can't have enough grizzly bears, right? I wanted to show you some footage that our naturalist Verlin, naturalist and biologist Verlin, who's also a bear expert, got of 399's subadult cubs. Now, I waited a little while to show this to you because I didn't want you to get too confused. We've been talking about a lot of different members of a family tree with 399 at the top, right? So 399 has had 20 different cubs over the years. We talked about her four cubs that she's got right now, the quadruplets. We talked about one of her cubs from 12 years ago, Grizzly Bear 610, who has the cubs of her own. But I also wanna spend a few minutes with her last set of cubs, now three years old. Let's check in with them. Now, for those of you guys asking, we do also have an update for you on Grizzly Bear 399's subadult cubs. So these are her cubs from her last batch. Um, these are two individuals that are actually palling around together for the time being, which is not unusual for young bears, but as they get older, they'll probably separate out. Now, one of these bears has some porcupine quills in his face. If you look at the back bear here, you can see some quills sticking out of his eye there. Um, update is he seems to be doing okay with those quills. Uh, he seems to be managing them okay. I'm sure it's uncomfortable, but the two of them seem to be doing just fine this week uh, without any real concerns. All right, you bared out yet? I hope not, because we've got even more bear footage for you in a little bit. But in the meantime, let's check in to some of the slightly smaller denizens of Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park. We've got a couple great views of some birds for you. Eco Tour Adventures guide Josh got this great view of a great, great owl, sometimes called the ghost of Yellowstone. These are big, huge owls that float on silent wings throughout many of the older growth and dead and debris river bottom forests of Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park. Laura got this great view of a cedar waxwing, and she explains how it got its name to her guests. They call them waxwings because they have this uh, waxy secretion on the end of their wings, which mm -hmm. almost looks like the red wax with a maker's mark. Oh, oh, yeah. Lastly, Verlin got a great view of a sand hill crane and her chick, commonly called a colt. Sand hill cranes can have a hooting cry, often heard throughout the parks throughout the summer. All right, some great views of great gray owls from Josh, some sand hill crane chicks from Verlin, and that really, really fun view of a cedar waxwing from Laura. So thanks for that. Now guys, we don't actually have that many people watching live this week. It's a little bit lower than usual. I'm a little disappointed. So don't forget to like and share our video, share it around. The reason we're doing these videos is a public service to let everybody see how great the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem is, but we definitely need to grow our viewership to continue to do it to make it worth our while. So I don't wanna to be too preachy, but we sure would appreciate it if you'll consider that. In other news, we've got some really fun views of some black bears taken uh, by our EcoTours biologist, Josh. Hello everybody, Josh again here from EcoTour Adventures. Want to tell you about this bear video. Um, this is a black bear, even though it is brown in color. You can see that it doesn't have a hump and it has a very long face. Um, one of the reasons that color is not really a very good way of identifying um, black versus grizzly bears. Uh, the video was taken recently in the burn area of Grand Teton National Park. And what we're seeing is that there's this abundance of green grassy vegetation and wildflowers that wildlife like this black bear, but also grizzly bears, moose, elk, deer, and other animals are taking advantage of now that the 
now that the wildfire is done and the landscape is kind of rejuvenated from all of that ash that's entered the soil. Um, bears eat a lot of a lot of grass. They're not super good at digesting it like a deer or an elk, um, but because they have a short intestinal tract, but they are able to get some nutrients um, from it. Eat probably about 60% uh, plant material and 40% meat, which is actually a lot larger um, meat content than other bears in other parts of the country where there's more edible nuts and seeds and flow flowers and berries and things like that. All right, I think that's our last bear video of this week. I hope that all those were entertaining for you. Tell us what you'd like to see from these videos every week in the comments. We do take requests. I'm glad to try and send out some of the guides to find some crazy things for you. I had some really strange views this week, including I saw a Northern Cardinal, a female Northern Cardinal this week, which is the first time in my entire career in the Great Yellowstone ecosystem I've seen one here. For all of those who live in Cardinal country, you're going, big deal. That's extraordinary. That's the rarest thing I saw all week, and that includes grizzly bears and wolves. So pretty, pretty cool stuff. Uh, but yeah, if you've got something you'd like to see on these videos, if you've got a video you'd like to share from your visit, go ahead and send it to us. Comment in the comment section. Let us know we're here to order, so to speak. Um, have you been to Jackson Hole? Have you been on a visit into Grand Teton or Yellowstone National Park? What was your favorite part? Where do you recommend folks go? Share that knowledge in the comment section as well. We'd love to hear what you have to think. Now, I'd be remiss if we didn't spend a little bit of time with all the hoofed mammals of Grand Teton National Park, of which we have great diversity. Mule deer, white-tailed deer, elk, moose, pronghorn, bison. We've got so many to speak about that we've only got time to talk about a few videos. Let's check in with them. We got an unusual view of some bull elk on the valley floor this week, which typically are usually up in the high country in the hillsides feeding on the fresh new green grass. So it was nice to see these growing antlers, which can grow up to an inch a day. You can also see that soft velvet, which provides insulation and blood supply to those growing antlers. Elk shed their antlers every year and regrow them. We also got a view of some elk cows and their new baby elk calves. This one was nursing. Notice the female actually is wearing a radio tracking collar. Lots of young baby elk out there in nursery groups, grouping up together, being watched over one by one by mothers who take turns while the others are grazing. And lastly, a brief view of a really cute little moose calf. All right, Kim just said she wanted to see some moose. So Kim, there's a moose for you. We'll try to get you some more moose next week. Susan told me she wanted to see some river otters. So I'll tell you what, I'll put our river otter expert Verlin on the case. Hopefully Verlin's watching. Okay, Verlin, you gotta go find some river otters for us now. Uh, and then I also see some really great uh, familiar faces. I see Kelly who went on a wildlife safari with me last week. So hi, Kelly. It's kind of like a big family now. It's so great to see everybody here. And I'm so glad for those of you who've tuned in week after week to join us. I'm incredibly flattered that you wanna share your Wednesday with me. And uh, it's been really a pleasure. So let's keep going because we've got lots and lots to see. Eco tour biologist Josh has a really great view of lupine, one of the best wildflowers of June and July. Hello everyone, this is Josh with Ecotour Adventures. I'm up in Northern Yellowstone country right now with my friend Toby who just wandered off there. I wanted to show you this plant that he was right next to. This is one of our favorite flowers that's blooming right now. It's called lupin. Uh, lupin is a legume, which means that it has bacteria attached to its roots that can fix nitrogen and add them to the soil. Lupin actually comes from a Latin term, that lupus, that means wolf. And uh, the reason it was named that is because lupin can be toxic to cattle. Uh, for all you Harry Potter fans out there, that's also why Professor Lupin was named that, because he's a werewolf. 
Here we have a domesticated wolf named Toby walking through a field of lupin. Thanks, Josh. We're gonna to continue to show you wildflowers as they continue to bloom up the hillsides and we get great, great views of them. It's something you should always come see us in spring and early summer to enjoy. Lupine peaks in, on July 4th, so we've still got plenty of time to catch some good views of lupine. Feel free to come check us out in Jackson Hole and come see it for yourself. Okay, everybody likes Mark's bird roundups every week. He's been tracking a couple different bird nests throughout the spring and summer. If you'd like to see some of these earlier versions, check out some of our old Wildlife Weekly Roundup videos. But everybody wanted to see how all of these birds were doing. So let's check in with Mark. Hi folks, Mark Bile here with a quick update on the nests that we have been watching so far this spring. Uh, the three red-tailed hawklets are all doing well and continuing to mature. Uh, their first round of flight feathers is starting to grow in and things are getting feisty in the nest. All three of those hawklets are continuing to grow and the nest seems to be getting smaller and smaller on all three of them. Uh, they are starting to show a lot more activity with trying to test those wings. Um, one of them almost fell out of the nest uh, trying to kind of uh, exercise the spread of its wings earlier. Uh, but so far, all three are continuing to develop in good shape, and we're in about the last third of their time that they will be spending in the nest. You know, right around the 4th of July is when they're going to be leaving that nest for the first time. So that's really good to see that kind of improvement. The hummingbird nest that we've been watching, a broad-tailed hummingbird, the female at this nest has been busy. Uh, we had a couple of cold nights this week and she was stayed hunkered down on those, as far as I can tell, there's two nestlings in that hummingbird nest. Um, when she has come back to deliver food, you can actually see her use that needle-like beak, like a hypodermic needle, to inject the regurgitant that she's feeding those nestlings uh, into their bellies. But I've, so far, I've seen two separate heads that are in that hummingbird nest. So as of right now, we can confirm that there's two hummingbird nestlings. And that female, it seems like the male is totally non-existent during this nesting phase. So this uh, responsibility is lying solely on her. And so far, she's doing a really good job of watching over those young ones and uh, keeping them well fed. So we'll keep an eye on them to see how they develop over the next uh, week or so. Thanks very much, Mark. Now, for those of you guys who don't understand how hard it is for Mark to film that hummingbird nest, those little hummingbird babies are smaller than a quarter. That nest is just a tiny, tiny, tiny little thing. And so to be able to get good views of that is absolutely unbelievable. And we certainly appreciate Mark's updates. So Susan, you asked for hummingbirds right before we showed you hummingbirds. I feel like a magician. I'm pretty proud of us. I hope that was pretty good. We're gonna to continue to update you on those red tail hawks and those hummingbirds as long as we can and as long as we can ethically continue to get that footage for you, which by the way is taken from a spotting scope, so way far away. Uh, and I know everybody enjoys Mark's update. So thanks very much, Mark. It's super, super fun. We definitely gave him an overtime job this week between the wolves and the hummingbirds and some of that other footage, including of the ungulates. So we sure appreciate that. So it's been a really fun week. I did want to tell you a little bit about sort of a fun event that we all decided to do, which is if you're familiar with uh, Grand Teton National Park, this is the Jackson Lake Dam, and there was tons of fishing line. So nobody asked us, but we kind of all went out um, as a group and picked up this fishing line, got a little fishing in. There's Canyon, uh, kind of our mascot, catching some fish. And boy, you can see all of the line that could have really damaged wildlife and, and probably occasionally does. So just a reminder to definitely pack it out out there, guys. Uh, we were super happy um, to help out and do our fair share, but it's sure easier if that fishing line never gets there to begin with. So kind of thought you guys would see it was kind of a fun thing to do. We like to try and do some fence removals, some wildlife beneficial work, as well as highlight local nonprofits in the area because as wildlife biologists and naturalists, these things are important to us. And so it was pretty fun to get out there and see each other, even though it was kind of a cold rainy day, uh, catch some fish and maybe pick up a little bit of trash. 
We've got um, a couple quick things to show you. Then we've got our trivia question of the week, which is a chance to win uh, a gift card in our Eco Tours store. And then I'll be answering your questions live, guys. So if you know anybody who would like to ask a biologist, a wildlife biologist, a question about the wild world, I'll take questions about zebras and lions, uh, if that's what you want to ask me about. If there's a kid in your family uh, who'd like to ask some questions, feel free to comment in the comment section. We definitely want to encourage those of you guys who did not catch this live. Um, you can still comment in the comment section. We'll answer your questions all week long. If I don't know the answer live, I promise I will look it up and find out the answer. We've also got some of our biologists answering things as we speak in the comment section. They may know as well. We all have different levels of expertise. Now we talked earlier about our fall photography workshop, which is coming up with professional photographer, Nate Luby. Let's go ahead and check in and see a little bit what that's going to be like. So the opportunity for a trip of a lifetime, and this is the year actually to try and do it. We're a little surprised we actually have some space available on this trip. It's a very popular one. Definitely a, a chance uh, to almost certainly see wolves, grizzly bears, bull elk fighting, moose in the rut. It's a wonderful, wonderful time to be here in October. So October 2nd to 10th, there's a link in the comment section if you're interested to find out more. I'm not gonna go on and on about it. Our goal is to show you cool animals today, but I do have to tell you, really a trip of a lifetime, an unusual opportunity. We do have some spaces left. So go ahead and check that out. Give us a call if you've got any questions and uh, we'll, uh, we'll look forward to hearing from some of you for sure. All right, we've got a pretty popular blog post that's up on our website and our blog um, talking about all the 4th of July festivities that are happening here in Jackson Hole. It's been a little confusing to know what's going on, what's not going on, what's been canceled because of COVID concerns, what hasn't. Um, if you'd like to know all those details, if you're going to be in town during the week of July 4th, this is a great resource to use. Um, I recently learned we're certainly going to have the rodeo going on with some social distancing, some other stuff going on. Uh, feel free to check out that blog post for more information. It's just a great resource and it's been just a really popular post. So we thought we would highlight that for you all just because folks who are visiting uh, might find that information useful. And I know a lot of the Facebook groups that this ends up getting shared to uh, are folks that are prospective visitors. So we wanted to give you guys a chance to see that. Now, okay, remember, I'm gonna be answering some questions live for you guys. So make sure you start asking those questions. I've already seen a couple good ones I'm excited about. So keep asking those because it makes me fun if you stump me. So try to give me something hard if you can. Um, but I did wanna go ahead and do our trivia question. So the way this is gonna work is if you think you know the answer to the trivia question you're going to answer in the comment section. We're going to start by answering last week's trivia question, um, which a lot of people got right. I think I'm finally finding the perfect medium. My first couple of questions I think were a little too dorky. 
And then I asked some, I think that were a little hard. Um, and then I asked some that were like way too easy. So I want to make it enough of a challenge for you guys, but not to the point where you have to have a PhD. Um, so the question last week was, what is this animal? Uh, I said that I wanted an exact answer. And for those of you guys who got it right, it was a yellow bellied marmot. That is a young baby marmot and an adult marmot. That's what the marmot clothing company is named after. So for those of you all who tuned in last week and got that answer right, congratulations. Um, our office staff has contacted our winner uh, for their gift card to our store. So if you would like a chance to win this week with this week's question, which I'm about to play for you in just a minute here, all you have to do is answer the question in the comments section. For those of you who are not watching this live, we will accept answers all the way until next Tuesday when we'll go ahead and do our, our random drawing to see who wins. So my question of the week is for a $10 gift card to our Eco Tour Adventure store, which is perfect for like four sets of stickers or gift cards or note cards or all sorts of good stuff that we've got there, uh, is what is this animal? Anybody have any guesses? I made it a little harder by having it be in the river, but it's gonna get out and give you a couple seconds of a really good view. So go ahead and comment if you know what animal this is. Anybody know what species of animal this is? All right, if you know the answer to the question, comment in the comment section. Uh, some hints, there's two different color variants of this animal in Jackson Hole. It was a relatively uncommon animal um, until 1995, and we'll talk about uh, why this animal's making a recovery next week. So thanks very much to Verlin for our trivia question. Definitely check out our Eco Tours Adventure store. We started that store during the COVID closure to pay for employee health insurance. 100% of the proceeds um, of that store, which has logoed clothing and photography from Thomas Mangelson, probably the most famous wildlife photographer on the planet. Um, note cards, stickers, uh, art made by the guides. If you want one of my mugs, I've got some mugs on there. We've got some amazing gunpowder artwork by our guy Chelsea. Check all of that out. There's a link in the comment section uh, and you can see all of that and hopefully one of you guys is going to win that $10 gift card. Okay, so here comes my favorite part. I'm here to answer your questions. So tell me what they are. Now bear with me, I'm gonna grab my iPad here and I'm gonna sort of scroll through our comments real quick and see what the questions we have are and then I'll go ahead and I'll start answering them. So if you see me looking down, that's what that's about. Let's see what we've got here. Ooh, lots of answers for our trivia question. Let's see here. Toya asks, any more baby badger sightings? We have not seen any more baby badgers this week. That doesn't surprise me. To see badgers at all is pretty unusual. I don't see them on trips every single day. I don't even see them every week. So we'll try to get you some more baby badger footage. Maybe we'll stick Laura back on the case since she did such a nice job last week with those awfully cute baby badgers and uh, see if we can't get you some more. I like lots of kudos for Eco Tour Adventures Guide Kirk, Captain Kirk. We all love him, who showed us that $3.99 video this week. Toya asks, what's the lifespan of grizzly bears? Toya, that's a great question. And Toya, I also noticed you ask me really good questions every week. So thank you. That makes me really happy. That's an actually sort of complicated question. There's sort of two lifespans we tend to talk about when we talk about wildlife, particularly mammals. We talk about their lifespan in captivity, and then we talk about their lifespan in the wild. 
And the fun thing about grizzly bears is as soon as we think we know anything about grizzly bears, we find out we're wrong. A lot of grizzly bear research is incredibly difficult to do. You can probably understand why. Um, to see a grizzly bear like 3 dollars 99 at 24 in the wild is incredibly old. Uh, you wouldn't expect to see a bear that age, uh, generally speaking. It would be sort of the equivalent of seeing a, uh, a human uh, who had reached the age of 100. It would be really a special event. There have been grizzlies found as old as 28, for instance, up in Yellowstone, but that would not certainly be something you'd commonly expect in the wild. In captivity, um, bears can live a little longer, but kind of an uh, unfortunate situation. Up until really the 1970s, bear diets were very misunderstood. Just like we were talking about earlier with Josh, um, up to 80% of their diet can be vegetation. And early Victorian uh, zookeepers who invented the concept of zoos all the way up until the 1950s fed bears, whether they be polar bears or black bears or sun bears or grizzly bears, a very heavy diet in meat, which caused a lot of problems uh, like it would in people. It caused congestive heart failure, clogged arteries, and a lot of zoo bears were dying from heart attacks until they realized they needed to give them more vegetation. They're omnivores, just like us. They need meat and vegetation. They need a mixed diet, nuts, seeds, uh, legumes, all that stuff is gonna be really good for a bear. Also roadside zoos were feeding bears horrible things like Twinkies and potato chips and thank goodness most of those zoos have been closed down now. Um, and so it's only recently that we've learned that bears in captivity can live quite a bit longer than the wild. Um, there are some bears in captivity that have reached the age of 35, um, some polar bears who've lived even longer. Uh, there's a, a polar bear who, uh, lived up in Canada, I think almost made it to 38 years old. I'd have to check my math on that, uh, but they can be a very long lived species. There are stories I've heard of bears in captivity living even longer than that, but not necessarily something I can confirm. So thanks very much for that question. That's a really good one. Lots more good questions. Lynn asks, do you get any groundhogs out there? Lynn, we don't have exactly what you'd call properly a groundhog, but we have a couple things that are kind of similar. Kind of fun, random, dorky fact. We have some of the greatest density um, and speciesization of rodents um, in the world. I'm sorry, not greatest density, greatest, greatest number of species of rodents. More than 42 species of rodents are present in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And when I say rodents, people are always thinking like little mice. Remember something like a, um, a beaver counts as a rodent, right? There's some pretty cool giant rodents out there, so don't misjudge them. We don't have a groundhog per se, but our most um, commonly seen uh, ground sort of animal like that uh, is called a Uinta ground squirrel, which looks an awful lot like a groundhog. Pretty similar in colorization and shape. It's kind of a, a mountainous version, perhaps. Uh, and locally, I grew up calling them chiselers. That was the name that we called them. Uh, I never knew that they were called Uinta ground squirrels until I went to college and had to learn <laughs> fancy scientific names for things. We also called marmots rock chucks growing up, which is the local name for those, another really awesome rodent. So um, you went to ground squirrels to certainly fit the bill. Um, we also have a couple of um, vole species that kind of behave in a way similar to groundhogs in terms of their diet and their tunneling. You'll see all these really cool montane vole tunnels and things in the spring as the snow's melting. Um, so no groundhogs here, but we do have some species that fill that same ecological niche. So thanks very much for that question. Toya asks, can bison have multiple calves? Toya, they absolutely can. We definitely see twins from bison, um, not uncommonly. It's, it's certainly, uh, it's pretty similar to people, which is to say humans can have twins, uh, but they generally speaking have one. Bison can have twins, but they generally speaking have one. I've even seen bison triplets. Uh, but I've only seen it once in my whole career. So uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I would say that in my experience, uh, the rate of twinning is pretty similar of the rate in twinning in people. Whether it's a genetic thing, you know, um, the um, 
people who are twins are more likely to give birth to twins, humans. I don't know if you all know that. There seems to be excellent evidence that grizzly bears who give birth to multiples, like 399, um, also have offspring who are more likely to give birth to multiples. There seems to be a genetic element there too, uh, as well as delayed implantation, which uh, we talked about last week and we can go into again another time. Uh, but the short answer is yes, we do see twins. It's pretty uncommon. Um, oftentimes those two calves are smaller than uh, the ones who have singles. They have a little bit of a smaller body weight. They're a little slower to mature, which does make them more vulnerable to predation. But the thing about nature is it always leaves a way out, right? So a certain percentage of humans are left-handed, just in case being left-handed provides an advantage one day, right? I'm left-handed, for instance. Um, Comment in the comment section if you're as cool as me and you're left-handed, by the way. Heads up, left-handed are the best. Um, in the same way, having multiples would certainly help if your population is falling um, in sort of an insurance policy. So most mammals are capable of having multiples, but pronghorn are really unusual in that they always have multiples. And that's so that they're evenly weighted while they're running, even when they're pregnant. If you've ever watched an elk run who's super, super pregnant, it's... Um, it's really, really comical and funny. And having recently had a child and been super pregnant, uh, I probably shouldn't make fun of super pregnant elk, but it's really funny. They just kind of stagger while they're running because they're so lopsided. And pronghorn don't have that problem because they're giving birth to twins. There's a baby on each side of their abdomen and they can keep perfect balance and maintain those extraordinary high speeds of in the 60 mile an hour range and even higher, um, even while they're pregnant. So great question, thank you for that. Awesome, Jan. Good to see another left-hander. Susan, you're asking for a replay of those badgers. We'll go ahead and we'll see if we can't put it on our um, Facebook page, do a little bit of a replay for you and you can check that out. Hang on, I'm scrolling through our comments here. It's so great to see so many comments. I love it. Rosalie, we can't see to, wait to see you in September. I'm so glad that you're going to be joining us. That's awesome. Toya asks, are there pikas in Yellowstone? Uh, so for those of you guys who don't know, pikas are these really, really fun um, little critters, and I say critters because they look a little bit like a rodent, but they're not. They're actually a lagomorph. They're in the rabbit family, and um, they have these big ears, uh, and they, they don't have any tail. There's just a little nub there, and they make these big chirp sort of chirp noises when you're up in the high country, up in the rocks. Um, and, and yeah, the answer, Toya, is that is probably the best place in the country to see pikas. We have lots and lots of pikas there. We have a lot of pikas in the Tetons. Um, if you're coming to visit, uh, definitely checking them out in Yellowstone is a great way to see them. But you can also just take a, a ride up the tram at the Jackson Hole Mountain Resort. Uh, and there's pikas up at the top of the tram there, or any high country hike. Anywhere there's a, a scree field, a field of rocks or boulders is a great place to see them. Pikas are really extraordinary. They're one of the only other animals besides humans who practice agriculture. And I know you're going, wait a minute, a rabbit practices agriculture. But hold on, it's really cool. So what they do is they harvest grasses um, all summer long, and then they sun dry them on rocks. They lay them out and dry them out on the rocks until they turn into hay. And then they um, take all that hay and they store them in their little, little dens. And then pikas don't hibernate during the winter. They're living up into high altitude areas where we're getting 600, even more inches of snow per year. But they're safe and comfy and warm in their dens with plenty of food to eat. And I bet you that little hay bed sleep, sleeps pretty well too when you're ready to take a nap. So pikas are one of my very, very, very favorite animals. Um, 
Maybe we can talk Taylor if he can to put a picture in the comment section for you guys so you can see what a pika looks like because they're really adorable. We'll see if we can't get you some footage of pikas. I'll put some of the, the guides on the case because they are really, really fun to see, particularly that chirping that you hear. Um, and I have a conspiracy theory about pikas, guys. You wanna hear it? So, does everybody know Pikachu? You know, the, um, the yellow uh, Pokemon with the, the lightning tail? Hopefully most people know what I mean when I say Pikachu. Uh, I have no evidence to back this up and I have no way to prove it, but I think one of the artists on Pokemon, uh, one of the original artists must have visited uh, the Western United States and seen a pika. And it would be very easy if your, your native language is Japanese to call it a pika. Um, most of our visitors call them pika. They don't realize it's called a pika. So you'll hear those names interchangeable. And uh, it's one of their most defining characteristics that they don't have a tail. And so if you were going to create a creature uh, based on that really, really adorable animal. It makes sense to give them a lightning tail, right? So I think that Pikachu and Pokemon is based on the pika, but I have absolutely no evidence to back it up. Go ahead and take a look at Pikachu and then take a look at, look at a pika. Tell me if you think I'm totally crazy or if my conspiracy theory is right and you can join my my little conspiracy club on that. One day I'll meet somebody from Nintendo or somebody big at Pokemon and I'll be able to ask them. But until that happens, just a theory of mine. So thanks very much for that question, that's great. Lynn asks, strange question maybe, do animals fall through the thermals or the crust or do they inherently know how to stay away? Um, Lynn, that's a really good question and it's not a strange question at all. Uh, in short, the general version is most of the time they know better, but mistakes do happen. So in Yellowstone, uh, near the hot spring and thermal areas, um, you know, Yellowstone is located right on top of a hot spot where magma is closer to the surface of the earth. That um, superheated magma superheats our aquifer, our underground water system, which creates steam uh, and boiling water, which comes out of the ground in these spectacular geysers and hot springs and all these great things that are worth seeing in Yellowstone. That can also make the ground very unstable. You can have an inch of crust with boiling water underneath, which is so why it's so important you stay on boardwalks when you're in Yellowstone National Park. Um, but of course, a bison or an elk, A, doesn't understand that, and B, they really don't like the boardwalks. Uh, I think the boardwalks are really slippery on hooves, so they'd much rather travel on the ground. And yes, you do see examples when you're in the thermal areas all the time of hooves that have gone through the crust. Uh, but of course, hooves are a little bit more hardy to warm temperatures than our bare feet. So generally speaking, those animals are probably not damaged. There is, however, um, a couple different places over the years that I've discovered bones inside thermal features. Uh, fountain paint pots, if you ever get a chance to go up there in Yellowstone, actually has a bison spinal process, uh, which is a bone sticking out of uh, that hot spring which is to say a uh, bison, not a calf, mind you, a full grown bison fell into that hot spring. Um, and then bison have this very specific bone. And that's why I know it's a bison on the back of their spine. They actually have a bone that sticks straight up. Think like a fin, like a dinosaur would have that forms their hump. Uh, and it's, there's actually a bone in there. It's fat like a camel, but there's a bone. Uh, and you can see that spinal process if you travel up to that hot spring. Uh, and you can see a couple other bones, including a little bit of femur, uh, slowly getting buried every year. It's a little harder to see. And those bones are slowly dissolving. So you certainly do see examples. I um, have never had the opportunity to travel out to the Shoshone Geyser Basin, uh, which is way, way, way out in the back country, back behind Shoshone Lake. Uh, but I'm told there are quite a few animal remains that can be found out there. One of those great backpacking trips, I want to try and do one of those years and go see what animals may have become trapped. So not quite to the level of the Libre Tar Pits or, um, you know, quicksand or something along those lines. But yes, animals do occasionally get stuck. Uh, fun other random little piece of trivia about fountain paint pots, just because we're on the subject. There's actually a really strange tree growing right out of the side of fountain paint pots and it's uh, a unique tree. There's no other tree like it in Yellowstone National Park. It's a pear tree. Uh, somebody must have been eating a pear on the boardwalk and then rather than disposing of the pit like they should have or the pith, 
uh, they dropped it and the ground's so warm there that it's been able to support a little pear tree growing. Uh, the elk clearly find this pear tree delicious because it's pretty stunted. But if you ever get a chance to go up there and you see sort of this random, very stunted, it's about yay big thing growing out of the side, um, I was able to talk to some of my botanist friends and identify it. Uh, thanks Kirk Taylor for that. And it uh, is in fact a pear tree. So how weird is that, right? Kind of neat. So thanks very much for that question. Let's see, do we have any more? I think that might be it for this week, guys. I'll check through one more time. Susan asks, what's a predator of grizzlies? Young grizzlies can be killed by male grizzlies. Uh, certainly they can be killed by bison and elk, uh, if they can find them, right? They certainly can be killed by wolves, um, particularly when sparring over carcasses, for instance. Uh, but a large male grizzly has no predators. They are, uh, they are on top of the food chain. They are the king of the ecosystem. So thanks, that's a great question. Tracy asks, do you have people out on tours now? Tracy, we do. We are doing limited private only tours um, where we're taking lots of COVID precautions with face masks and gloves. Everything in the car is sanitized. We use alcohol and sanitizing spray. Um, you know, we as guides have zero interest in getting sick and uh, we certainly don't want to catch anything. We certainly don't want to give anything to everybody. So we've worked really, really hard on finding a way to operate safely and ethically in a way that makes everybody feel comfortable and we still get some great trips out there so yes uh don't forget if you request a particular guide for your trip that guide gets 10 percent of the proceeds of the trip so if you saw a guide today uh who you really liked and you thought kind of jived with your personality make sure you request that guide uh and see if they're available to guide you um maybe you're a mark kind of person or a verlin or a josh um definitely remember that and uh you, we will definitely take requests. We take requests for animals for our videos and we take requests for guide tours too. All right, I think that's everything, everybody. I have had so much fun answering your questions. You guys got me some really good ones this week, which made me just really happy. It's been a pleasure spending this Wednesday with you. I hope you all have a wild week and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.